Welcome, foolish mortals, to Count Gauntly's Horrors from the Public Domain. I am your host, Count Simon Gauntly, and each episode I'll be leading you on a journey through the history of film. Specifically, we'll be exploring that eldritch abyss known as the public domain. These are films forgotten by time or abandoned by their creators. The strange, the horrifying, the poorly and cheaply produced. All of these are the purviews of the public domain. So what are we waiting for? Come, join me in my crypt. Uh, it's bigger on the inside. Come, come, join me. There lived a man so long ago, Count Gauntly was his name. His horror host abilities had brought him wide acclaim. The people flocked from miles around each Gauntly movie night. Not knowing that the films he showed infringed on copyright. Upon discovering this fact and learning it was true, an angry mob of lawyers formed with pitchforks torches too. They tracked the count and sought to stop his movie hosting ways. And torches blazing put an end to Gauntly's earthly days. But our man was too resilient to let death be the last word. He stirred set up upon his slab and vowed he must be heard. So he stocked his tomb with gadgets from the local studio. Intent on showing movies on an awesome TV show. But he had to find a legal way so Gauntly racked his brain. But then he learned of something called the public domain. Now here he is, the time has come, his dreams are coming true. Count Gauntly's here to share a film and hopes that you won't do. Uh, hello, and uh, welcome to Count Gauntly's Horrors from the Public Domain. I'm just sitting here having a bit of a, a think, a bit of an existential quandary a little bit. I, you know, I've been thinking on this, uh, this show here in this crypt, we've, we've gotten so used to, to joking around about death that I think maybe we don't always appreciate how serious it is. Like, uh, you know, it's a big deal. The end of, uh, the end of life, sunshine, uh, blood pressure, no more of that. And it's, it's a somber occasion. I don't know if we always represent that here. You know, we got, we got uh, vultures. Does that, does that scream significance and like a meaningful tribute to those who have gone before us? I don't know. And maybe we could strive here at Count Gauntly to just be a little bit more melancholy about the whole thing. We got to take things serious. I mean, who, who are we, who are we honoring with with what we do here. Anybody? Is this, is this honorable? Is this, whoa, whoa what's, what's going on over here? Uh, uh, huh? Huh? Um, to what exactly is that, Agra? It's a bouncy horse. Uh, I think that might be the opposite of what we're trying to achieve here. What? Agra, what? It's no. good fun. I've got a bit of a different mission statement here, I think. Because... This, what do you think of when you think bouncy horse, Agra? I think Agra having a great time at birthday party. Well, you know, we are in a, a catacomb, a crypt. It's the realm of our dearly departed. And we need to, I think, show a little bit more respect than we've been doing. But we never show respect. Maybe it's it's what we do. Maybe it's time to start, you know? Maybe, you know what? I know 
what we need to do for this horse. It's been cast aside by the world above, and we need to show it, show it some respect, show it some honor. We are going to hold a funeral for this bouncy horse. A solemn, dignified, honorable farewell in the form of a funeral. But we had such good times. Well, this is what it deserves, I think. Just respect. We'll get our friends here to, to pay their respects. And we are going to class up our act. We are going to finally pay the dead the respect that they deserve. So. I'll go out to fetch rat, Graham. OK, yeah, get it, get it in here. Come on. Ah. Ah, Bernino, my old friend. You shall, you shall do the honors. Tell the people out there, the former guests, that we are making this a respectful, honorable place, my friend. So go, go spread the word. Send them out, Agrat. He gone. Good, good. Now, now we wait. It is written in the Old Testament, to each of us, this allotment of years, three score and ten. And in these years, there is the time of man, a time to fulfill his destiny, to work together with his fellow man in the wonderfully complex pattern of everyday life. A time to be born, and a time to grow, to become aware of the loveliness of all things living, to learn the happiest lesson of all, that the fullness of life can only be tasted when our happiness is shared with others. And later, a time of maturity, to reflect, to relax, to enjoy. Yes, this is the heritage to which we are born, the blessings to which we may all look forward. Yet, here in my parish, there are some who can only look back. They are the victims, unable to reap the full enjoyment of the days of their years. They are the victims of themselves. My church is in a railroad town, not far from a big freight terminal and repair shop. In my congregation are railroad people in every capacity, and not one who isn't safety conscious. Accident haters, all of us, hating the waste, the pain, the needlessness. Yet try as we may, do what we will, there comes a time. Fellow worker hurt, you never get hardened to a sight like this. But it isn't only what happens to the man in the ambulance. There's another story behind most accidents. The story of what happens to the others. You might say I've got sort of an inside track when it comes to knowing the inside story behind an accident. And it strikes me that the ones who are hurt most by the carelessness that causes accidents are the ones who weren't even there. I often stop by here for a cup of coffee. And whenever I do, I'm reminded of the things that happened to the people who weren't even there. I reread the story in the sad eyes of the girl who serves me. This is Helen. Although she has never been in an accident, Helen is nevertheless an accident victim. Her eyes were not always sorrowful. Once they were bright and shining. Yes, I remember how those eyes used to glow whenever Helen thought about Joe. Joe Tendler was his name. 
In those days, Joe was about as average a young fellow as you'd be likely to meet. Young, nice looking, easy going, good company. He hadn't a complaint in the world. Well, maybe one complaint. He was getting a little tired of being a bachelor, eating on the run, cleaning up your own place if you got around to it. But all that was due for a change pretty soon. Yes, Joe was a pretty lucky guy. A good job as road electrical foreman, a wonderful girl who wanted nothing in the world more than to be Mrs. Joe. On his way to the job that morning, Joe had to stop by to see Helen. There was something he'd forgotten to give her last night. Joe, in front of all these people, behave. But of course, Joe was behaving. The way any lucky, happy young fellow about to be married would behave. It was only natural. Joe had to take off in a hurry to reach that job on time. To the impatient Joe, the men seemed almost purposely stalling as they stowed their gear. And now, the wheels of fate were set in motion. Call them the wheels of fate, or the wheels of chance. But consider, the man at the wheel was in the driver's seat. It was Joe who was calling the turn of the wheels. You went through a stop sign. Better take it easy, Joe. The others, they were along for the ride. Whether they liked it or not. Liked it, they hated it. But what could they do? They were trapped. Yes, Joe had a thing. And he just couldn't get there fast enough. it was payoff time. One, still able to move. Two, still able to move. They had escaped the trap. Their three score and ten were still before them. But the trap had sprung on Joe. Yes, now it was payoff time. Easy going Joe Tendler. After a year in that neck brace, Joe wasn't quite such good company as he used to be. But the words said, for better or for worse, in sickness or in health. Sure, Joe tried to call it off, but a girl like Helen doesn't run out. There was quite a difference between Helen's dream and the reality. There'd be quite a difference between living with the dream Joe and the real one. It needn't have happened at all. There are many days in the years left for Joe. For George Price, there are fewer. And the days George does have left are embittered days, flavorless, futile. To George, the sound of that approaching car as it nears the house across the street prods back into his memory, a scene he has fought to erase, a scene he cannot forget. This is Lenny Bellows, the boy across the street, the boy who once was like a son to George, just across the street, where every day George can't possibly help seeing him. And every day, George remembers. 42 years of good, honest work. George was proud of those years, proud of the strength and stamina that had kept him going. But today, somehow, he didn't feel so good. And when it was time to go back to work, George wondered whether he was going to be able to make it. Funny, these last few weeks, he hadn't been quite up to snuff. Nobody noticed. He hadn't mentioned it. Probably just indigestion. He'd be all right if he could only hold out until retirement time. But now he had a job to do, 
and nobody was going to say George Price gave up on the job. And so, as Fred Bellows climbed up to go back to his job, George went back to his. A small voice whispered, report sick, get a relief man, don't be a fool, George. But George had a job to do and he was going to stick to it. So there was George and Fred. And Bill said, come on, easy. It was over three years ago. George still can't get around very well. Lenny Bellows still lives across the street. And though he has long since forgiven George, yet his simplest actions have become to George signs of rejection and hatred. And there George Price is doomed to stay, across a little street a thousand miles wide. As I said before, most of my congregation are railroad people. I know the road does everything in its power to prevent accidents, to see that equipment and working procedures in the shops are as safe as it's possible to make them. There's to keep the men aware of the life and death importance of observing safety rules. Still they come, the ones who forget, even for the barest fraction of a second, that with safety, there are no second chances. Not all trips to the hospital, though, are necessarily disastrous. For example, there was the trip Charlie O'Neill made with his wife. That was about the happiest trip Charlie ever took. He and Sue had been looking forward to it for years, waiting, hoping. Finally, it happened. There'd be a new little O'Neill along any minute now. Charlie was so happy, he forgot everything else. Well, almost everything. He didn't quite believe them a little later when they told him it might take a while and he might as well go back to work. They'd call him. On the way to the shop, he remembered something. It was just about the last thing he did remember that day. Cigars. They weren't going to catch Charlie off base when the big news came. He hoped it wouldn't be too long before he could break them out. There was a phone call coming, he told the foreman. A big one. Please get it to him fast when it came. Charlie did remember one more thing that day. To take proper care getting Bill's attention. Gentle pressure on the shoulder so as not to start with. That hissing open flame is deadlier than any snake. Charlie knew it. Every man who works a torch knows it. When you come near them, you come up smooth. You don't make any sudden motion. This was it. Phone call for Charlie. Yes, yes. A boy, nine pounds, wow. You can forgive Charlie for being excited. Who wouldn't be? A newborn father is one of the most excitable people in the whole world. You can forgive Charlie for passing out cigars during work hours, even though he knew he should have waited till lunch. You can even forgive Charlie for what happened next for that one instant of final, fatal forgetting.
Yes, you can forgive Charlie for everything. And you can understand how it happened. But one thing you cannot do, you cannot change it. It is written in the Old Testament to each of us this allotment of years, three score and ten. When you add that up literally, it says that the days of our years number 25,567. A trivial accident might take away one or two of those days. A serious one might take away a hundred or a thousand. Or suddenly, there might be no days left at all. The Lord has allotted them. Let not man by his thoughtlessness diminish the blessings of the Lord. Received our rat grams. Hello, the Governor Thelonious joining us once again. Oh, well, I don't know what to say. As soon as I heard that there was a death of a dear friend of yours, I knew I had to be here right away. Um, I can't say I know much about your friend, but you have my deepest sympathies in your time of need. Oh, that's good. Good to know. Thank you very much. Glad to have you here. It means a lot. And uh, our next guest out there. Oh. A face we've not seen for a while. Hello, sir. Uh, and, uh, we're glad, can I get your name one more time? Um, you have a dollar. Uh, you have a dollar. Oh, you have this. Money. Okay, cool. about these things. Come on in, sir. It's good to, good to have you here. Please, please take a seat. We'll have refreshments later. That might okay. interest you. Okay. Sounds a little, little jolly there. Turn it, scale it back, okay? Yeah, okay, there we go. And uh, who, who else is out there now? Oh, maybe it's uh, the critic. We were sorry to hear about your loss, Gauntly. Thank you for, thank you for coming in our hour of need. It's a serious time. Hello. Hello, thank you for inviting us. Yes, I'm glad you could be a part of it. Now, on this serious, solemn, sullen day. And now, I suppose the only thing left is to begin. It's the best way to start off. So, let's bring in our dearly departed friend, Paul Bearers, to your places. dour demeanor. That's what's called for in a time of death. So here we have the newest addition to the crypt here. There you go, monster. Hogrod. Good to have you here with me. Now, that the guest of honor is among us. I 
thought it would be only fitting for us each to say a few words to mark his, her, its passing. So, if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind. Uh, horse, though you may have lived your days in one place, you helped many children ride across the world on your back, feeling the wind in their hair. As they bounced up and down, they traveled across the Wild West and out into the sands of the desert. Thank you for the joy you brought to them. That was very touching, thank you. Oh, bouncy horse. Your loss has struck me deep inside. I'm, I'm moved and I'm very sad. I, I had my own horse when I was a kid. It was a horse named Leonard. He had the same shimmering off-white coat, the same dead eyes. Oh, and in the great storm of 47, a plague of owls came. He, he had just built me my first tree house and he went to chase these owls and <laughs> never saw him again and I'm just I'm so sad to see you laying here I know what the loss of a horse can mean to, to someone truly fewer deaths are sadder than those of owls but those of bouncy horses just might be among them any words from you sir uh, um, I like horses but I can never afford one because I've been homeless. But thanks for having me. When are we going to eat? Homelessness is its own tragedy. It, it's, it's good to have you among us, sir, to, to join with our, our serious occasion. Oh, yeah. yeah you this is we serious. Oh, yeah. I dark, we're facing dark problems today. We're the reality of, of the grimness of society. Thank you. For you. Thank you, sir. When are we gonna eat? We'll get there. Okay. And uh, and you, Thelonious, any any words from you? Um, Bouncy Horse was was that his name? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, hmm. Uh, let me see here. Bouncy Horse, uh, you I'm sure you were the pride and joy of your plastic family. Um, I'm sure you brought joy and, excuse me, plenty of joy and happiness to the people who you let ride on top of. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't do this. Well, I, what do you mean? That didn't this, sound so serious and sincere. This thing is a plastic toy. I, it's, it, it's not dead. I'm pretty sure it was never alive in the first place. I don't, I don't see what this is all about. I'm sorry. Look, okay, there's a reason that we're doing this, okay? A reason we gotta be serious today, and even when it comes to a bouncy horse, because what is, what is a crypt? It's a place for things that have been cast aside by the world. That's what dead things are. Their time on the surface is over, and people just throw them out like they're trash, right? Yeah, no, it, they toss them out like it's a dump or something, and they don't have a place anymore. Nobody's there to respect them, nobody's there to show them any love. They, they toss them away for, for pennies or nothing, and they, they're, they're forgotten. They're left to rot in the rain and, and fade away. And, and that's not what we stand for here. You know, we've we just been cracking jokes and not, not giving things their due, their due diligence not giving things a home but that's what we we need to be doing okay it's what we've done with movies it's what we do with monsters so why not why not a bouncy horse why can't this too have a place here in the crypt so this this is the destination okay things things leave the world up above and we got to give them a home here and you know what if you guys can't appreciate that just just roll the roll the movie roll the this is a haunted house, the haunted house, 1921, Buster Keaton. Just, just roll it.
So there, you see the haunted house, Buster Keaton, 1921. Yeah, those, those guys, those crooks in the movie, they didn't respect death. They made light, pretended they were ghosts and stuff, and, and th they were criminals, you know? They weren't, they weren't paying their respects. What, what is up with that? What's up with that? You know, Gauntley, um, I just wanted to share a word with you. Yeah. Um, I was in a speakeasy just a fortnight and I, and um, on the jukebox they played a little ditty named Vienna by an up-and-coming balladeer named William Joel. And it's, it's a song that he wrote when he went to the city of Vienna uh, to, to visit his dad out in Austria. And, uh, you know, he, he heard this song uh, playing on an accordion in the background, and he saw a, uh, a nice old lady sweeping the street. And it got him thinking about these, you know, how in, in America and, you know, in Western culture, sometimes we tend to discard the old, the dying, and yet here was this wonderful old woman sweeping the street as if she was a sprightly young girl. And, and it was her prime. And, you know, it just got me thinking as I listened to this song that, you know, there, there are other ways to, to be respectful. I mean, just, just you know, the, the movies, the culture that you bring to your show, that you bring to your crypt. I mean, that, that's, paying, that's paying respect to it on its own. I mean, you know, it doesn't always have to be somber. Just just by honoring it and celebrating it. That's, that is a, a form of honoring the dead, of honoring the old, of honoring the, the discarded that you fear may have lost its value. And I think the crypt is great just the way it is. Just, you don't need to change it. You don't need to make it more serious. These flowers are nice, but let's celebrate this bouncy horse. This is, this is a bouncy horse. It's not a, it's not a dead person. Let's, let's use it for what it should be used for. Fair. What you, what you say makes some sense. We do share with the community via, via our cameras out there, with you, the television viewer at home. We share by coming together as a community. We celebrate that these things live, be they people or old forgotten films or bouncy horses. And you know, you may, you may not be far off the mark. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, who says that a funeral has to be solemn, has to be sad, has to be so serious? I mean, when you think about it, why not have all the other emotions as well? You can be happy, you can laugh, you can enjoy yourself some way or another. And you know, when you think about it, there are not that many places that would allow such a type of thing. And I think the best place to do it is right here in the crypt. That's what we all really need. And that's why we keep coming back here time after time after time. Oh, shucks. That makes, that's great. That's great news. I'm glad you guys are here. And you know what? You're right. I've been a, I've been a square. I've been a fuddy-duddy. And I've been the kind of square that it's not hip to be. And so, you know what? Let's, let's liven this up. Let's, let's wake in this wake. Let's, let's get it kicking. Come on. Let's, let's liven it up. Let's really get it going. Yeah, that's what it's about. Giant fish. Come on, monster. Give me a hand. Let's resurrect this bouncy horse. Huh, yeah! And, and I have something just, just perfect for this occasion, this, this re-livening. Here, non-brand specific cream-filled sandwich cookies. Ha, oh, almost a full package. Here, let's get some of those, get that tab off. There we go. Mm. Blood colored. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. What do you think? Yeah. You know, you guys better really than your cooking. <laughs> what was that? It's better than your cooking. Yeah. Well, what you gonna do? Sometimes store-bought is the best way to go. Yes. Keep going. <laughs> How about we get you riding on the horse for a little bit? Come on. The monster should enjoy it too.
Glad to have you Fantastic. with me here. Bogrot, living the life, even if we may be dead. Hopefully it'll continue like this for many years to come. For sure. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From glen to glen and down the mountainside, the summer's gone and all the go and I must abide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow. It's I'll be here in sunshine or in shadow. Danny Boy.